were driving in from D.C. yesterday. Um, I've only been here once before, and because Jess is kind, she said, we'll give her another at-bat. Um, but when I came the first time last year in October, I went, oh, I feel like I'm home in Tennessee. I'm from Nashville, which is why I sound like I'm uneducated, um, <laughs> because I have as much twang as anybody else. I'm actually from Orlando, but I've lived in Tennessee for the better part of 30 years, and so it just gets on you. You can't help but say y'all if you're eating grits. And so when I came driving in here a year ago and the trees were the color of fall and I saw these hills, I thought, ooh, I feel like I'm home. There's something about the mountains that makes me feel like I'm home. And I thought of a story yesterday when I was driving in. I was like, oh, my goodness gracious. Um, I used to run in the mountains. I uh, used to live in Colorado with bigger hills. And one of my favorite things to do was to trail run. Now, I'm 58. I don't trail run much anymore. I'm in stretchy pants. But, um, <laughs> but I used to run a lot, like Jessica. And, um, and I was working for a ministry out there called Folks on the Family. Great ministry, super conservative. I was told that the line between my big toe and my second toe was reminiscent of cleavage. And so I would cause men to stumble if I wore open-toed <laughs> shoes. So they were, they were a little conservative on the dress code, so brother, you need to praise me. I'm wearing boots this morning so you won't stumble. That always troubled me. I was like, if a man stumbles over my feet, I think he has bigger issues. But anyway, I was on staff with Focus, and I decided I was going to leave that ministry to go to seminary because just because of the platform of Focus, I was having the opportunity to teach a little bit. I wanted to be less of a heretic. And so I decided I was going to leave Colorado, move to Nashville. And, um, and I thought, I've got to run in that park just one more time because I'd run in this mountain trail system just hundreds of times when I lived out there. It was kind of my cow gun take me away place. But they had told us, the television reporters and newspapers, not to run in that particular park anymore because there had been some criminal activity perpetuated against women in that park. So I thought, well, I just want to run there one more time. And the last Saturday I was living in those particular mountains, it was a perfect fall day, kind of like yesterday. Just blue, blue sky, crisp weather, that almost sweater weather. When you're excited, your legs aren't going to stick to the seat anymore. Just like, yes, fall is here. And I thought, it's too pretty for criminal activity today. And so I thought, I'm just going to chance it. Surely, you know, all the criminals will be in a pool hall. No offense to you pool players, but I thought I'll be fine today. And so I drive to the park. It's called Palmer, Palmer Park, Palmer, Pulpit Rock Park or Palmer Park, one of those, if you go to Colorado Springs. Um, and I thought, it'll be perfect today. I drive in the parking lot. There's only one other car in the parking lot. And I thought, okay, cool. I'm going to have the trail to myself. I get out, I walk to the trailhead, the stretch, and there's two signs from the Colorado Police Department on either side of the trailhead very clearly warning people not to be on the trail system. It explains that there's been some violent crime, and it says don't hike, don't trail run, don't mountain bike, do not be on these trails until the, the criminal is apprehended. But I thought, oh, I'll be fine today. And so I start running that trail, because I'd run it hundreds of times before. And Jess, you know that euphoric feeling. You've got one of those runs, it's just, you can kind of let go of all your anxiety. And this particular run kind of snaked up through this evergreen uh, forest, you get to the very top of the trail. It's about two miles up through this forest. You get to the top and it opens up into this mountain meadow. And it was kind of like when you start coming down that hill toward Martinsburg and you can just see forever. From that mountain, you can see Pikes Peak. You get to the top and Pikes Peak is just right there. And like even July, it's shrouded with snow. Gorgeous. And so I'm running and right when I get to that, that Alpine Meadow, and that was the place where I would just sit and kind of soak in God's glory. You know how you'll have one of those places, you're like, how people can wonder if we have a creator, how did that come from pond scum? I mean, there's no way, God had to create that. So I'm running to that spot, and right as I step into the meadow, I stop dead in my tracks. I'm going to go over here, and I'm using you, Pastor. From about me to Derek, there was a naked man. And I was like, oh my, now this has nothing more to do with pastor. I'm just using him as a prop. Let me make this clear. It was not Pastor Derek, but it was a, it was a naked man. And I was like, oh my heavens. I thought I have run smack into the criminal in his birthday seat. And so my first feeling was just indignation. I'm like, dead gummit. You know, I've been singing a hymn running up here, and I've run smack in the criminal in his birthday suit. This is my place to be alone with Jesus, and he is messing with 
talking about that? Like at first I got mad. Then I thought, uh-oh. Now he hasn't seen me because I'm mostly behind a pine tree and he's naked man's looking off that way. So look off that way, Pastor. So yeah, <laughs> she's kind of looking off that way and I'm mostly behind this tree. And, and after getting indignant, I realized, uh-oh, I'm in a heap of trouble because I left my cell phone in the car. There's only one other car in the parking lot. I'm here by myself. The sun is starting to set. There's wilderness between me and my car. I'm, I'm up here with probably a violent man, and I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Now, when I get nervous, I'm like a junior high boy on Mountain Dew. I'm just like, whoa, I can't think clearly. And so the only two clear thoughts were in my head that afternoon were one I had seen on, I think it was Oprah, that men who, sorry, gentlemen, but who expose themselves are uh, typically cowards and non-confrontive. So I had that one thought. Then the other thought I had was that um, if you come upon a wild animal, I used to hike a lot. If you come upon a wild animal in the woods and you are west of the Mississippi, it behooves you to put your hands over your head and advance toward the wild animal, <laughs> all the while speaking in deep guttural tones because then that throws the animal off like a mountain lion. They think you're a bigger animal and they run away. And so those two thoughts formed what I'm going to call logic this morning. And yes, you're in church. We're going to get the Bible in just a second. But I thought, because I, 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 I thought he's going to get me if I don't do something. And so those two thoughts made me think, I better jump out from behind this tree and kind of throw him off his game before he attacks me. And so I took a deep breath. Naked man still stare that way, Pastor. Naked man still stare that way. I took a deep breath. He has not seen me. And as he's staring off that way, I jump out from behind that tree and I start running toward the naked man going like this. Hey! And it works because this naked man jumps up, just obviously, just totally startled. And then he takes off running in the opposite direction. And when he takes off running, I noticed for the first time that he was actually wearing very, very, very small blue running shorts. And the way he'd been sitting, you know serious runners, Jess, you know those guys you compete with, and their shorts are split up the side. Supposedly it gives them, you know, more room to stride. But the split will splay. And the way he was sitting, it was splay. Y'all, he looked so naked. I promise he looked naked. But what was a trip is when he's running away from me, he's looking over his shoulder, you know, terrified I'm going to attack him. And I just watched him run away and got so tickled. I thought, I bet he's running straight to his therapist. Like, you know, I was up there praying for my family and this big girl came out of the woods. Y'all, scaring innocent men loitering in Mount Meadows, that is mild compared to I've the danger. Again, by the way. You, yeah. That was just one time. Yeah. That was just one Any time. of y'all running I've with the woods in shorts, you be careful of big girls um, who run towards you. I thought I was doing the right thing. I, scared. I can't wait to meet that man. I mean, I just know one day he'll go. I was a guy in blue shorts. Um, maybe that's who I'm going to get set up with on eHarmony. Would that not be cool? Um, I'm 58 and single, so 1-800-588. Please call Lisa for a date. But um, I think we do the same thing I did to that man to God. I was predisposed to think there was trouble. I was halfway behind a tree. The sun was setting. My vision was obscured. And I thought for sure he was in his birthday suit. And he's probably just a family man having a devotion. We turn blurry perspective toward God and we make all kinds of assumptions. All kinds of assumptions. And I think one of the most dangerous assumptions that we have made with regards to this love letter, this is not a rule book, it's not a collection of morality tales. At its core, this is a love letter. We make this assumption that part of this book is angry God and part of this book is sweet Jesus with hair extensions. And that is not true. First of all, our God is a Trinitarian God. Trinitarian God. If you brought your Bible, turn to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, have y'all ever imagined God's voice? Don't you imagine him to have a voice like the guy in the Allstate commercial? You're just that deep. I'm going to be totally flustered if we get to heaven and God is a tenor. <laughs> then God said... Let us, those of you who have brick and mortar Bibles, and if you're comfortable writing in your Bibles, underscore us. Let us make man in our image. 
St. Augustine says, only the Christian God is a perfect community unto himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't just appear in the barn in Bethlehem. That was incarnate Christ. He's been there from the very beginning. Holy Spirit didn't appear in Acts 2. That was a New Testament debutante party. He's been there since the very beginning. Our Trinitarian creator, redeemer, God said, I'm going to make y'all in our image. You're going to be divinely wired for value and community. Regardless of your ethnicity, your uh, socioeconomic background, your gender, you, I have set my image in you. Every single one of y'all bear my thumbprint. Even those outside the family of faith bear my thumbprint. I have made humanity in my image. A priest in the second century by the name of Irenaeus called it a mago day. That's just Latin for the image of God. We bear God's image. It was based on the Roman uh, habit of Roman emperors who couldn't be everywhere that they were ruling would have statues built of themselves and people would look at that statue and remember, oh, I'm under the authority of emperor such and such. God says, you're my statues. I'm going to put you all over culture and people will look at you and be reminded of me. It's stunning, stunning. He didn't start mad at us. He said, you are my people. Male and female, you're my people. He breathed them into existence. My friend Chris Kane says, God sneezed and out came the world. Now she's teasing because there was intention to it. But seven times he breathes in Genesis. And seven times after he breathes, everything we know and see as humans is created. There was void outcome. It comes vibrancy. One of the misnomers in our culture is you bring your potential to God and it gets bigger. That's just not even biblically defensible. You bring your nothing to God. He breathes on it and something supernatural comes out of it. So y'all know the first two. Now I want this to be interactive. What, who were the first two, male and female? Adam and Eve, made in his image. Now I'm a wind bat. I'm long-winded, so I need Pastor Derek to help me. So I want Pastor Derek, can you get us from, he's brilliant and he's concise. I can't land the plane. So if we're going to get out of here by 1.30, I need you to help me. I need you to get us from Imago Day. He makes them in his image to right before they're kicked out of Eden. Yes, sir. Yep. So the first thing that comes to my mind, hey gang, is it all right if we just take our time? Mm? Is that all right? Yeah. Mm? Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind. You'll miss the crowd anyway. Right, right, right. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, there was a girl that I was trying to impress at church. Yeah. Uh, so I bought the perfect outfit to impress the perfect girl yeah. at the time. But then when I woke up, I had this massive zit on the end of my nose. And so I looked like Rudolph, yeah. you know, yeah. and yeah. the entire way to the church, I was picking at it. I was oh, picking at it because I was trying to fix my image. Yeah. And then my dad kept saying, don't pick it. Yeah. Don't pick it. Yeah. Um, but I thought I knew more than him, yeah. you know. Uh, so then I get to church and I'm bleeding. It oh, looks sure. like my nose is oh, swollen. Sure. Um, it makes me think of Genesis. Uh, God says, don't pick that. That's right. Don't pick that. That's right. Eve is trying to fix her image because right. she wants to, um, she, oh, she wants to receive partial image of God, just not the rules or the relational aspect of God. Because if God is in her life, then God needs to call some shots in her life. Right. And so it's best for me to take partial image, but then also my image. God says, don't pick that. She says, uh, yeah, 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 but um, I know a little bit more about what I'm trying to yeah. fix. So then she takes the apple, the forbidden fruit. Right. And um, we don't know if it's an apple, but right. for story's they sake. They say it's an apple. Could have been a pomegranate. Could or have a been. Beggar. Could have been. Yeah. Um, so then after she tried to fix her image and thinking it was working because not all consequences of sin happen immediately. Right. Right. She thinks it's working. Hey, this is great. So then she pulls out her cell phone. She DMs her husband right. and is like, hey, big Adam, come over right. here and check out this pomegranate <laughs> I just Adam. got. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, Big Adam. I like this story. This and then Adam better. came out of the I woods wearing these little shorts. No, Big Adam. He looked pale and wimpy, so I'm loving Big Adam. Okay. Yeah. 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 And when you, as a kid in church, when you pictured Eve after, because he, the enemy played her. That lion, son of a gun lizard said, do you really think God is for you? Which is why so many of us still think he's an angry God. Do you really 
think God is completely for you. I mean, he, this little part he said you couldn't do. He plays her. She doesn't know God said, don't do this because this is for your good. This is protection. This isn't punitive. Mm -hmm. But after she is played by the lizard and takes a bite out of that rotten fruit, how do you just as a kid, not now as a grown man, but as a young man in church, if you had to have a mental image of Eve, what would she look like? My mental image is coming from the old school uh, flannel graph. How many people remember yeah. the flannel graph? You know, she was that. a little bit, um, she, uh, she was always presented maybe a little flirtatious. Trashy. Uh, trashy, playing around with sin. Then she plays Adam. Right. And then they're blaming each That's other. Right. And all that. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I pictured her because I have more sin in my BC days than pastor. Um, I pictured her with a tube top and Daisy Dukes because in, in my, the town I grew up in, the cool place to go was the skating rink and there were girls at the skating rink who didn't skate, but they skated with boys in the back, if you know what I mean. Um, and they always wore tube tops and which that's fine. If y'all wear tube tops, that's Lovely. Um, I don't want to throw shade at anybody. It might behoove you to wear a shirt over it, but I'm just, just, just a little encouragement from an older sister. Um, they, they, wore, they wore tube tops. Usually there was an ACDC logo somewhere, and then they wore Daisy Dukes and heels. And so that is totally my picture of Eve. I just think she's the original trashy girl listening to metal. I mean, she's just trashy. And so when we get to Genesis 3, we've got Imago Day. We've got, he loves them. He gives them Eden. They've got all this fruit. And it's not just paleo or keto. Like they eat everything. He's got hot bread for them. I think it's significant. He called himself the bread of life and not the kale of life. That's all another sermon. <laughs> but I think it's a big deal. And, and so after she has what we would call original sin, she disobeys. God with intention. Here's what happens. The man called his wife's name Eve, verse 20 of Genesis 3, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So even though they're sinners, he set them up in Louis. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. If you're comfortable writing in your Bibles, I want you to underscore drove out. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so it may vary just a bit from your preferred translation. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every which way to guard the way to the tree of life. So in my imagination, my daddy left us when I was a kid, and then there were some men who came and went from our family who did things to us that men should never do to grown women, much less little girls in the dark. And so I already had a preconceived idea that anybody in authority might mean me harm. That's that blurry vision that we superimpose on God. And so when I picture Eve as being the original trashy girl with the tube top and Daisy Dukes, and it says God drove her out, I picture God as being like big old white haired. It's all funny we picture him white. I'm like, well, he actually came Jewish, so he probably wasn't pale. But that's another sermon too. So I picture in this big white headed patriarch, and I picture this trashy girl, and it says drove out. So I picture drop kick, just ba boom, and trashy girls booted over the wall of glory. That was kind of my picture in my head. Sorry, I spit on y'all too. But that was, it was very, very punitive. It was a very, and I thought, well, she deserves it. I mean, goodness gracious, he gave her a whole grove and then says, just this one tree, don't eat from this one tree. I'm like, well, how, how disobedient can you be? And then we have all kinds of mess now as women. I'm in stretchy pants because of Eve. It's her fault. Like, I just think she was just a yahoo and it's all been downhill from there. And then I started studying this passage in seminary in the original Hebrew and I was stunned because those two words in English drove out that sound like God is drop kicking this trashy girl for making a mistake. It comes from one word in the Hebrew, it's gal rosh and it means to herd redemptively. It's used twice in the book of Exodus when God is leading the Israelites out of captivity. They were so comfortable as slaves they didn't want to go to freedom. Remember, they said, we really love the drive-throughs in Egypt. 
Like, we just got Blaze Pizza. We're not sure. We, we want to go to Canaan. I mean, what if they don't have Starbucks? We're really comfortable in captivity. And it says God drove them out of captivity because they were comfortable as slaves. He drove them to freedom. This is not punitive. It is original sin, and our God is absolutely holy, absolutely transcendent. But he condescends to be compassionate with us. He says, you matter to me. I gave you Sabbath because I want you to have a day of rest because you're not slaves anymore. I don't want you to die at the median age of 31. You matter to me. So I'm actually carving out some promise for your good. We call them rules. They're like the bumpers in a bowling alley that keeps your ball from going in a gutter. It's, this is for your good. This is for your good. This is for your good. I was talking to a man recently, godly man. And he said, I would give anything to have one night alone with my wife. And I thought, that's kind of odd. He's in his 60s. I know he and his wife have been in ministry faithful all these years. I thought, I, he just doesn't seem like a player to me. And he said, Lisa, I was promiscuous as a young man before I married my wife. And he said, we've been married for 35 years. And he said, you know, we've both aged quite a bit since we said I do. And she knows where all the bodies are buried in my life. And so when she's mad at me because she knows me and, you know, she doesn't look like the girl I married because we've both aged, he said, it's real easy for me to go to those images in my mind of the people I was promiscuous with in my 20s. And he said, here's the thing that's so cruel about Satan, about that lion son of a gun lizard. Those images don't age and they don't argue. And he said, when I'm mad at my wife, I bring all of them to bed with me. And I thought, oh, he wasn't saying don't have sex outside of marriage because he's a killjoy. He said, I know what it'll do to your mind. In 20 years, I know how it'll erode your intimacy. He's not a killjoy. He is a perfectly loving father who says, you might not get this now, but I'm doing this to protect your mind and your heart. I love you. He says, Adam and Eve, you've committed original sin. And now if you come back in and you eat from the tree of life, you're going to be forever suspended separate from me. You're not going to enjoy the intimacy I created for you to have with me. So I'm going to begin the process of redemption to herd you toward reconciliation. I'm going to begin to move you toward a freedom that you don't begin to see yet. You can't dream about yet. You don't have the faith to pray for yet. But I'm hurting you for your good. Y'all, he's never been a mean God. He's always, always has been in the process of redeeming our inherent dignity as a Mago Day. Always. Always has, always will. He has always been in the process of mitigating the evil that wounds us. He's not a capricious God who delights when we're punished. His discipline is always braided with mercy. He has always been in the process of hurting us toward Jesus. There's no meanness in God. There's holiness and there are contextual civil issues that we don't get as 21st century believers. We look back and go, ooh, that seems rough. Uh, it seems rough to me. He must be an angry God. Flip to Genesis 15. Look at two stories real quick. Pastor, I need you to help me, and it really will be 1.30. Genesis 15. To set up Genesis 15, remember that geriatric couple that were wearing Depends, and God said, y'all need to go to Costco and buy Pampers because I'm going to cause you to be regenerated. You're going to have kids. Abe and Sarah. Remember Abe and Sarah. And remember, he tells Abraham, you're going to have more kids than stars, if you could count them. I'm, I'm going to breathe a theocracy out of you. Israel is going to come out of you and Sarah. Even though you're taking Metamucil, I know this doesn't make sense to you. You're going to have to buy a minivan. This is going to be incredible. Y'all remember this story? Talk, pastor, about when he gave Abram that promise to Genesis 15. Because the promise, like you said during the prayer time, didn't happen like that. Not in the human time frame. He said, you're going to have children. And then he said, you're going to have to leave where you're comfortable. You're going to have to go to a new place. And they 
packed a U-Haul. Sarah was mad because she loved her Weight Watchers group. She had to pick up, <laughs> go to a new place. They get to the new place, and it didn't happen right away, did it? Yeah. You were doing such a good job telling the story. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> she got messed up. And right. Abe got messed up because he was like, you said I was going to be a daddy. Right. And I mean, I used to be able to sling those tools from Home Depot, and I'm getting weaker and weaker. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. Maybe I didn't hear you. Right. Maybe I got all amped up in service because it was emotional. And I got really fired up because I'd had too much caffeine. And I ran to the altar and I really believed you because the song was good. Maybe you were speaking metaphorically, not literally. Maybe it wasn't for me. Maybe I just got all excited. And he starts doubting. And we get to Genesis 15. And here's Abram, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, fear not, Abram, I'm your shield, your reward will be very great. But Abram said, hear this, verse 2, because some of y'all are right here, but Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Do you hear him? I don't see it. I don't see it. I mean, you gave me a promise. My wife is still ticked. We packed the U-Haul. We moved into this trashy little community that neither one of us liked because we were big shots in Ur. We've moved here, and I thought it would take about six months, and it's been a decade. Did I mishear you? Are you really a good God, or were you just punking me? So maybe I should choose one of the guys who works for me and he should get jiggy with my wife and we'll just call it my kid. Is that what you meant, Lord? Do you say, oh, he goes right back to Eve? Did he really mean good for me? It's interesting how time in the human context brings with it unbelief. Man, we do not wait well. Oh, Lord God, what will you give me? Because you have fallen short of your promise. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my house, hold, will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, You sissy, faithless, little wormy. Mm -mm. It's unbelievable God doesn't chastise him. If I was God, I'd be like, Sure damn, I'm going to kill this guy, and I'm going to create like a holy like lumberjack of a man who won't struggle with his faith. God doesn't. He's slow to anger, rich in compassion, God said, Abram, I want you to look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able. And he said, so shall your offspring be. And he believed, this is why Abraham is in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, verse 6 of Genesis 15. And Abe believed the Lord and it counted to him, sorry, and it counted to him as righteousness. How long did he believe God? Do y'all remember? Two verses. He believed the Lord and then, verse 9, but he said, oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I'm to possess it? Well, I mean, he went from like, okay, okay, I'm raising my hands. Oh, I don't think he'll do it. I mean, he is just a weenie sissy baby, just like us. Yeah. If you're in a season where your faith is flagging, don't despair. All of the saints went through seasons where they went, I can't see it. I can't see it. Paul says, we see through the glass dimly. And then God says, I want you to bring me a bunch of animals, and I'm going to shorten this. I want you to bring me a bunch of animals, and I want you to cut them in half, and I want you to have the blood drain into a ditch. And Abe goes, okay, cool. Now, if God told you that, you'd be like, oh, goodness gracious, this is like something on pay-per-view. I mean, this is just <laughs> janky. i got to cut animals in half. Abram doesn't balk because why? Just why doesn't he balk? He knows the covenant. This is pre-literate culture. They didn't have written contracts. There were no attorneys, no lobbyists during this season of history. And so when you're making a covenant, binding promise, a legal document with somebody, you would act it out. And the most binding of the covenants during this period of culture was called a blood covenant. It was most often made between two clans when members of those clans were marrying. So let's just say, Jess, I need you up here for a minute. Let's just say that I'm marrying, let's say Jess has an older brother um, and he's 50. Five, I'll go younger. Um, he's 55 and he's a, a contractor yeah. who is yeah. literate, who can read, handsome, handsome yeah. and holy and hot, hottie yeah. McTotty. And so, what was your maiden name? 
Taylor. Taylor. So Mr. Taylor, Jess's daddy, and my daddy, Mr. Harper, get together because they're representatives of their clan. And my daddy brings some animals from our flocks. Mr. Taylor brings some animals from his flocks. And then what they would do is they'd cut those animals in half and they'd have the blood drain into a shallow. They'd get a rototiller from Home Depot. They'd do this little shallow trench. The animals from the blood would drain. Are y'all hear me? Do you hear how this sounds weird to 21st century ears? Any text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. You have people who do not know who our God is, who don't believe he's always been a redeemer, and they're like, ooh, that is some janky Jerry Springer mess in the Old Testament. And you go, not if you get our God. Not if you take the time to get context. You go, oh, my heavens. So the blood is in this ditch. Mr. Taylor takes off his shoes. My daddy takes off his shoes. Mr. Taylor, because I'm going to marry him. What's your brother's name? This imaginary brother. Because this could be prophetic. Henry. So Mr. (laughs) Taylor, on behalf of Henry, walks through the blood. Gets blood all the way up to his ankles. And then he steps aside. My daddy does the same. Our daddies stand there with blood on their feet. This is pre-Canaanite blood covenant. If you want to study this a little more, Tim Keller has some great stuff on this if you Google it. They would walk through. Then they would say to each other, in this, essentially this, they would say, if something happens between Lisa and Henry and their vow, their bond as husband and wife is severed, may what was done to these animals be done to us. Now, I'm not trying to diss any of y'all who've walked through divorce. God doesn't hate divorced people. That's not what Malachi says. It says he hates divorce because of what it does to his people. And so don't be thinking you wear scarlet letter D if you've been through a divorce. That is not at all the unpardonable sin. God says don't do it because it's going to break your heart. It's going to break your children's heart. In the Old Testament, they didn't have divorce as often because the whole clan said, we're in this. We're in this. So when Lisa comes back from Gatlinburg with Henry and Lisa's emotional because she's 22 and is shocked, he leaves the seat up. Then, and I go, I'm coming home to my daddy because Henry is sweet to me. Because she's emotional and had Bee Gees lyrics for wedding vows. <laughs> then Mr. Harper goes, no ma'am, no ma'am. Our whole family is behind you. You get back with Henry and we'll pray over you. We'll get another couple to disciple you and y'all are going to keep this thing together. That was, that was old covenant marriage. Now listen, this is so important. During that period of history, if a commoner, let's just say Mr. Taylor is a king, if a commoner marries into royalty, guess whose daddy walks through the blood covenant? Guesses? Mine. Because her daddy's already proven he has collateral. He's royalty. Only the commoner walked through in the case of royalty marrying a commoner. Now stop and think. Abram has already showed, I am weak. I can't hang on to faith for more than one verse. I'm struggling here. I can't see it. You promise. I'm trying. I'm giving it my best human shot, but I'm struggling. God says, get some animals. He's like, oh, I know what we're going to do. We're going to do a blood covenant. He gets the animals, cuts in half. And then if you read the rest of the story in Genesis 15, it says, Abram falls into a deep sleep. In the original Hebrew, that does not mean he was unconscious. He could see what was going on. And that what comes through the blood covenant? A flaming torch and a fire pot. Those are theophanies. That's just a fancy seminary word that means a physical manifestation of God himself. Listen, this is before the cloud. This is before Shekinah. It's the very first time God condescends to any kind of a physical form outside of the spirit. And what he does is he goes, even though you're the one who's supposed to walk through because I am the God of the universe. I'm the king of all kings. I've got all the collateral anybody will ever lead. But let me tell you, man, when you break the covenant with me, I'll pay the price in my blood. I'll pay. We sing there's power in the blood and we don't even know what we're singing. From the beginning of time, it's not just Jesus who was compassion. It's our creator, redeemer who goes, I love you so much. I love you so much. I'm not going to let you miss this. When you walk away from me, 
I've got you. I will cover you. I will pay the price in my blood. Y'all, he's always been good. He's always been good. Deuteronomy 22 says, if a man violates a woman and lies with her and isn't married with her, and I want to be careful with the kids, but that's the R word that rhymes with ape. If he does that to her, then he gives her father 50 shekels and then he marries her and he cannot divorce her all his days. You read that through a 21st century perspective and you go, my goodness gracious, that is just some nasty mess right there. That's why people think God is angry. But if we understood that culture that they've just come out of captivity, they're under the first iteration of Sharia law and that's using the word a tad loosely, but they really have just come out of Middle Eastern culture that was super, super, super anti-women. So under first iteration of Sharia law, it was common for any woman, it was actually legal, for any woman over the age of 12 who was not married or divorced could be violated by any man in their culture and guess what happens to the perpetrator? Guess what happens to that really had been the man, the naked man who was attacking women in that park? Guess what happened to him? Nothing. Nada. No traffic violation. Guess what happens to your daughters who were just violently abused? Guess what happens to them? They are marked as damaged and considered forever unmarriable in their culture. Let me tell you, as a woman who's been through a lot of that kind of abuse, it makes sense to me that there are people in our culture who think God is angry, who think he's a mean God because they superimpose what they've experienced on this perfect father, this perfect husband. He says, I'm not just your creator, I'm your husband. And they go, he must mean evil for me. Deuteronomy 22, 22, God effectively, one of my professors says, steps over the fence of culture. People can be misogynist and abusive. Power structures can be misogynist and abusive. Our God has never been abusive. If you get context, he's always been kind, always. He steps over the fence and he goes, here's the deal. Any of you yahoos who are considering abusing one of my daughters, here's the deal. You're going to set her up. You're going to establish a 401k with her daddy. Women couldn't hold property during that period. She can't have a bank account. So he says, I'm going to make her financially independent. You're going to pay and you're going to set it up through her daddy. Then you're going to marry her, not to re-abuse her. They practice polygamy. He says, you're going to give her a name because nobody else will marry her. So you're going to restore some of the dignity that you stole, you evil Yehu. And then, if you don't provide for her for the rest of her life, you know, this is a super misogynistic culture. Women were chattel. We were traded like farm animals. We had no rights. God says, if you don't take care of her for the rest of her life, you get stoned by the community. Is that an angry God? That's a good dad. That's a dad going, no, I'm going to protect my children. I love my children. Everything I set in motion, y'all may not get it, but it's for your good. I love you. You will have people who will judge you because of the color of your skin. I gave you that skin. You're a beautiful son to me. Our culture, it can be so cruel. It's, I can't even imagine how our God weeps over the way we treat each other. God doesn't do that. He's never done that. He's always been a good God. He sees you. He loves you. He made himself accessible to us. He's not angry in the Old Testament. And pale Jesus with hair extensions who hugs lepers in the New Testament. He's so much better than that. Our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been for us. They will always be for you. Like Abram, sometimes we don't get it. Sometimes all we see is the discipline and we miss the destiny behind them. We miss that he's rubbing stuff off us that actually will wound us, that will ruin us. Sometimes when he rubs off those edges, it hurts because we don't see the destiny and we don't see he's always moving us 
toward promise, toward intimacy with him, toward relationship. He's not mad at you. He is not mad at you. He's in love with you. You're precious to him. You're worth protecting to him. The gospel in its simplest form. When I had my eyes on Jessica before we were married, I pursued her. And when I thought my love and my affections captured her affections, I asked her to be mine. True story. She said no. <laughs> and so I pursued her again. And this time, when I was convinced I had her heart, I got down on a knee and I asked her to be mine. This time she said yes. That is the gospel. God pursued you with his love and with his affection. I don't know how much more I can show you in how many more ways. I sent a prophet, I sent a priest, I sent a judge. I sent my presence. I sent the cloud, I sent the fire. I sent my example. I said, people on my behalf. And when I thought my love had captured your heart and your affections, I asked you to be mine. In us trying to pick out our own identity, we took our own fruit and we said no. And so God took off his shoes and he walked through blood. And this time when he thought he'd captured your attention and your affection again, Instead of getting down on a knee, he said, I want to make a commitment with you to death do us part. I'll go first. And so he gave his life so he could show you how far he was willing to go for Adam and Eve's like us. I love the thought they were driven out of the garden for their own protection and safety only to find out, if you keep reading the story, he was still pursuing them. You can't stay here. In my love for you, we've got to move outside from what is normal to you. In my love for you, we can't stay here. We got to move. But I'm not kicking you out. I'm going with you. Psalms 23, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And while you're going, just look around. He prepares a table before you, even in the presence of your enemy. That snake in the garden, <laughs> let him watch. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's coming a day where we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know what that is? That's family talk. That's marriage talk. Yeah. Yeah. How does God love somebody like me? What am I going to do? with somebody's love like his. That is what makes grace so amazing. Stand up with me across this place. If you don't have a relationship with God, he's not in the driver's seat of your life. You know of him, you believe in him. Maybe you call him a higher power or something like, no, no, no. God doesn't wanna just be an object of your theological understanding or your beliefs. No, he wants to be a personal God. That's why the Bible says that he's a relational God. He uses marriage to describe the relationship between him and you. And if you don't have a relationship with him, today's your day. Would you just put your hand in the air? I'm willing to give God my life. Thank you, sir. Proud of you, ma'am, sir. Yeah, right, right. Over here, Uh uh-huh. Yep, yep. Oh, I'm ready to come home. Yeah. Congratulations to those that raise your hand. Do me a favor. Your best life doesn't start with this. It starts with a daily surrender of this. And I love the thought, Lisa, I love the thought that God took Adam and Eve out from where they were. Then he took Abraham out from where he was uh, for their benefit, right? 
uh, because faith is a journey. Yeah. It's not one big step. It's a journey. It's a process. Right. Right. And in right. God's love for you, he wants to accompany you on the journey of your faith. But then he's given you a physical family called the local church body to say, you know what? Let's do this thing together. Let's do it together. I'll encourage you. I'll pray for you. You encourage me. You pray for me, and together we can do this. You know, the Latin word for confidence simply means faith together. We go together, right? Courage is taking up your heart, your spirit. But confidence says, let's go together. And I don't know who this is for, but let's do this thing together. Let's do it together. One more time, would you raise your hands as an indication your heart is lifted? Band, I'm going to throw you for a loop, but just follow me. You can have my heart. You can have my heart. Have my heart. You can have my heart. Have my heart. Just say that over and over again. Give God the broken places you of your life. Have my heart. The failed relationships, have the broken identity, heart. the wounds of life, have unmet expectations. Heart. I thought this reality oh. said this. God, you can have it all. Lord, we know we can trust you. Thank you for walking through that blood. Thank you for giving your blood. Thank you for giving your life. Thank you for being a God that we can trust. Thank you for being a kind God. Lord, we marvel at your miracles, but it's the kindness of God that draws us closer into repentance and closer to our relationship with you. It is the nicety of God that has brought me to a greater revelation and understanding of your presence and of your glory. Thank you, God, for not being mad at us, but for being madly in love with us. Thank you for pursuing us. Though we ran with apple in hand, there you were pursuing us with nail-scarred hands to say, I want you back. You can have You can have my heart. You can have my scars. You can have my past. You can have my hurts, my habits, my hands. You can have my failures, my success, my disappointment, and everything in between. I say yes to you. Freedom for your people, God. Freedom. The weeping endure for a night. Joy comes in the morning. You can have my heart. You can have my heart. You can have my heart. voices one time take our heart we give it fully and completely to you even the parts that nobody else knows about we can trust you with them in the name of Jesus hey church do me a favor if this mes message resonated with your spirit in a very real and personal way and you want more information on what it means to following God and giving God your heart on the daily, which is what we're all called to do. Hey, don't just be satisfied with responding in a moment. No, 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 let's get past emotion and let's get into discipline. Let's walk this thing out. Marriage, let me tell somebody, marriage, um, just to finish the story, is better being married than it was at the ceremony of being married. You know what I mean? Like this is, there's a lot of hoopla and stuff, but to walk this thing out, it, um, there's commitment involved. There's discipline involved. There's humility involved. There's other relationships that we need involved in our life. Let us help you help yourself to become all that God's called you to be. Text the number set or a text faith. Everybody say faith. Faith to 797979. Faith to 797979. We're gonna send you a link 
filled with information. You can stop over here at the hello counter or you can meet us up down front. We want to not just pray for you, but to equip you to walk this journey out. Somebody shout, I'm walking. Everybody say together. I'm walking together in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.